Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on our agenda this morning. The CPSC staff will brief the commission on the recommendations to allocate future unexecuted balances should balances be available to support extra project work. The CPSC staff members briefing us today uh, at the table are Dwayne Ray, the Deputy Executive Director for Safety Operations, and Jay Hoffman, the Director of the Office of Financial Management. Thank you both for being here and your willingness to provide us with the information and, and answer our questions. At the conclusion of the staff briefing, we will turn to questions from the commissioners, and those rounds will last 10 minutes each. We will now begin with the staff briefing. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Burkle. Uh, if we could go to the slides, please. Okay, this morning, uh, this uh, briefing will be kind of in two parts. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes providing you with an overview of the uh, uh, mid-year request, and then I'm going to spend some additional time on mid-year projects one and two because I think those pro uh, require some additional context in terms of what the staff is recommending. Uh, with respect to the overall mid-year, staff is recommending that the commission authorize projects to fund from unexecuted balances if available. Um, currently, we are forecasting an unexecuted balance of around three and a half million dollars. Uh, the sources of that unexecuted balance generally consist of pay and non-pay items. These are fluctuations in, in staffing levels, essentially, and sometimes it's operating funds that, that for one reason or another, are unexecuted. Uh, we've identified approximately $5 million in projects that have been presented here in priority order. It would be our intention that if approved, we would fund these projects uh, in order subject to available funds and acquisi acquisition feasibility. <coughs> Uh, in the mid-year memo that was provided to you last week, uh, there was uh, this table along with a t an attachment that described in detail each of the projects. I'm not going to go through them in detail here, but I would just note that the first two projects are for enterprise data and systems. Uh, the third project uh, in CARES is for exposure data. Uh, project four is to modernize saferproducts.gov, adding some mobile capabilities and uh, improving content. Uh, project five on lithium ion batteries. Project six, our business process review that will inform needed upgrades to the IFS system. Uh, seven is enabling testing of Internet of Things uh, enabled projects at the electrical lab. Uh, project eight is follow on work for our smoke alarms work that was started in a prior year. Uh, nine, gas appliances. Ten, the child strength measurement. This is augmenting existing work and existing contract that we have going on. Uh, project 11, ATV stability. This would complete the multi-year ATV plan that we put together a few years ago. Uh, 12 is uh, safe sleep warning labels. And finally, 13 is an implementation plan and roadmap for our e-commerce work. All right, so with that, I want to transition now and spend some uh, the remainder of my time on uh, mid-year projects one and two. Uh, these projects are components of a larger future vision for uh, that staff is proposing for the CPSC for an enterprise data management and analysis capability. Um, I want to take some time to provide you some context on how these two component projects fit into that larger enterprise vision. So first off, um, this has obviously been an emerging priority and topic of discussion in these sessions for the last several months. And I think this has been discussed in a whole variety of ways. I've, I've heard it described in terms of enabling an enterprise data management and availability capability for the agency. I've heard people talk about how to leverage data across the enterprise so that we can have better insights. Um, there's been a lot of really robust conversation around using new tools, uh, advanced analytical techniques like um, pattern recognition and artificial intelligence. Uh, and I've also heard conversation around establishing new positions and, and uh, new roles and new skill sets. And I think all of these are great, but what, we, but what I've tried to do is pull together a team of people and say, okay, given all of these ideas, uh, what can we recommend? Can we recommend a path forward? <clears throat> so staff has proposed two mid-year data projects to advance the agency analytic capabilities. Uh, let me describe these in some detail here, and then I'll provide you the larger context. So first is mid-year number one, an IT data strategy and implementation plan. There are two components to this mid-year project. It's important to understand. Component number one is 
what is the bigger picture strategy? How do we make data available at an enterprise level? Level? How do we make it scalable? Uh, how do we then leverage that enterprise data to improve our analysis, to improve our analytical outcomes? And what are the tools that we can identify and the specific use cases, the analytical questions that we're trying to answer? And I, I think there's ac actually some clarity on this. People are, there's an appetite for a big picture strategy and that's what this is looking for. The second component though is what I've heard less conversation on and that is once we have this larger picture strategy, what is the technical implementation plan described in business terms in order to implement it? What are the resources required? What are the tiered levels of funding? What sort of time frame are we going to be looking at? This is likely a multi-year, uh, large dollar initiative. So that's mid-year one. Mid-year two uh, is, a, is recommending a pilot study uh, on machine learning and artificial intelligence. In other words, we want to try to pilot something to inform the overall strategy and have some learning by doing. What this project would entail is using open source code and uh, open source tools, uh, probably artificial intelligence and pattern recognition, uh, and to rapidly deploy these tools in the next six to nine months so that we can learn from the results to inform the overall strategy in mid-year number one. We have proposed three use cases, and I'll talk about those in a subsequent slide, around automated coding, data ma matching, and data translation. I think by tackling this to, to do a proof of concept to see if these technologies and these tools and these techniques can work for us, that will inform a larger dollar initiative. And let me emphasize that the goal is to award this and to try to have results by the end of the calendar year, or if not the end of the calendar year, early next calendar year. All right, so now let me provide you some background on the overall context on how we got to these two ideas. Um, several months ago, uh, I formed a, a sort of an informal se team of senior leaders here at the agency to try to uh, continue the conversation that I think has happened in this room. Uh, and we began that by trying to define the problems that we were hearing and the problems that we were perceiving. So I think it's worthwhile to just sort of take a look at those so we know what we're trying to fix. Here's, this is probably not an exhaustive list, but hopefully it sounds familiar. Um, one, our, we have disconnected data. Our data is very useful within specific CPSC organizations, for, for example, import surveillance and the work we're doing on the RAM, but it's less useful across organizations. The, the data and analytics in CPS RMS are not part of the RAM data set. We all know that. Two, our systems are disconnected. Uh, major program areas maintain their own data sets and business intelligence tools, uh, but those tools are not shared across uh, organization. So CPS uh, 360 is different than the RAM system. Um, our processes are labor intensive. We have a lot of labor intensive processes. Uh, specifically anomaly detection is highly dependent on people. It's highly dependent on the integrated product teams. Uh, four, let me emphasize this one because it's going to come up again. The COT solutions available to us have proven to be limited. There's no out-of-the-box software solution that's fits CPSC's unique analytical problems. It likely requires high levels of customization. And I would go a step further. The market research is as actually suggesting that other agencies don't really have our problem. Certainly there are big data problems at other agencies, but not really like ours. Um, five, limited agency skills in, in areas like data science, SaaS development, artificial intelligence, um, data management. Not saying we don't have great people, it's just we don't have very many people. Uh, insufficient funding, this is, this is a, the kind of investment that will be a major investment that's needed to fundamentally evolve our analysis systems and approach. We're going to need to think in new ways in terms of how to fund this at the scale that's necessary. And then lastly, where to start? Um, do we start with the strategy? Do we start with quick wins? Do we start with modernizing our existing systems? Do we do some process mapping? I think that this lack of clarity maybe has created some false starts, so I simply identify that as a challenge. Now, I do think there are some opportunities in pursuing a modern data analysis strategy and new analytical tools at CPSC. Hopefully, some of these are evident to you. But number one, I think there, the opportunity is to develop a big picture plan, establishing an enterprise data strategy and forming the technical plan to implement that strategy over time. That is what mid-year project number one proposes to do, is to check the box on item one on this list. Uh, number two, uh, there's an opportunity for enterprise analysis. 
uh, to create the environment for cross-application of predictive analytics to identify new insights and correlations within and across data sets. So making the tool set available, sitting on top of an enterprise uh, uh, data paradigm, CPS 360, DCM, IFS, RAM, all pulling from a common source. Uh, trying to solve this sticky challenge of anomaly detection, enhancing the ability to identify occurrences involving low incidents and large volumes of data, applying new analytical techniques and tools like artificial intelligence, pattern recognition to replace or supplement integrated product teams, and so on. Uh, the next one is, is dealing with more data. I think the term of art is boosting data ingestion. So if you want to feel cool with your kids, this is the, this is the term of art. Uh, essentially making it scalable. How do we expand our capability to access and process new data streams without overwhelming, uh, overwhelming our systems and overwhelming our people? Uh, it's, it needs to be timely, it needs to be relevant. We need to enable an enterprise data availability, making data available across uh, our programs, having the methods, tools, and standards to do that. I've talked about deploying new analytic tools. Uh, these are custom business intelligence use cases developed using open source programs that can be customized for our particular needs and problems. Uh, this presents an opportunity to standardize our data practices. If data is going to be available at, enterprise, at an enterprise level in um, enterprise systems, it's going to have to uh, adhere to some standards. And finally, I think there is the opportunity for some quick wins. Our market research has validated the idea that we can test some of these tools now on a limited scope and uh, limited scale and have some results in the next six to nine months. And item number 10 is what mid-year number two proposes to do. There are a number of attributes for a successful project. I have listed five here that I think are critically important if we decide to pursue this proposal. Uh, they are here. Uh, the first principle of success is that this is likely going to be an open source and customized tool. Um, that is specifically configured and implemented to meet our unique needs, things like anomaly detection, product categorization, and data matching, to, to name a few. Number two, we're going to need a high-quality consultant uh, with a demonstrated track record in this space for developing open source, customized solutions. I will tell you uh, the market research we've done uh, thus far, uh, this is a fairly uh, narrow uh, market space right now. Uh, number three, there's going to be a lot of learning in this. Uh, we're going to have to accept some learning by doing. That will be an important element of the approach. Not everything that we learn will ultimately work or fit into the final enterprise solution, but I think the initial use cases will be incredibly important to informing the overall strategy, and again, that's what mid-year number two proposes to do. Uh, funding, we're going to require a multi-year funding strategy with support throughout the Commission, OMB, the White House, Congress for the resources that will be required to implement an, inter an enterprise solution. And lastly, we're going to need a scalable procurement vehicle once we identify a quality contractor that can support a phased implementation. All right, so now let me provide you kind of the bring it all together here in, in the three-step process. Uh, on how we would uh, propose that we move forward. So our objective is to formulate, implement, and execute an enterprise data management and analysis strategy to drive improved mission outcomes. Step one, uh, we would first develop an enterprise data strategy that identifies in business and technical terms what the CPSC would like to be able to do with its data, and then we would develop the technical multi-year implementation plan to achieve that strategy while supporting existing capabilities. We estimate that that'll cost around $750,000. The time frame would be to begin immediately and have this by uh, the end of the calendar year and start formulating resource plans against it early next year. Step one is what mid-year number one proposes to accomplish. Step two, uh, we want to solve one to three tangible mission-focused use cases that can be developed and deployed quickly. We want to learn from those results, refine the strategy, demonstrate quick wins, and build momentum to step three. We believe that this can be accomplished for around $700,000. The time frame would be this calendar year or early next calendar year. This would be the point of departure for the scalable procurement vehicle that I described on the prior slide. Lastly, step three would be to build the enterprise data implementation plan from step one. Uh, this would be 
this would be everything. This would be the enterprise data management, data availability across the agency. This would be the business intelligence and new open source analytical tools. Uh, this would be defining uh, more use cases and analytical questions that we're trying to resolve. The cost of this is obviously not known yet until we have number one completed, but this is likely a multi-year effort requiring multi-millions of dollars in a scalable procurement vehicle. So what might this look like? So step one is, a, so what I have here is this is a conceptual framework. This isn't necessarily what it would look like, but this is to try to hold the picture in your mind. So mid-year number one proposes to build this picture into reality, whatever it may look like. I think it's likely to look something like this. So let me just kind of focus on step, uh, this, this middle portion here. Uh, data sources. We have a lot of data sources. We know that. We have IDIs. We have hotline information. We have nice data. We have retailer reports, information from saferproducts.gov, information from the RAM and import system. And there may be dozens of other data sources we haven't yet considered that ultimately we'd like to add to our, our, our ingestion capability. The idea would be to take all of these data sources and then cr the second piece of it is to create a data ingestion capability using automatic data extraction and organization to index, categorize, and format the data in a way that isn't so labor intensive, where the computer does some of the heavy lifting to get it ready for analysis, uh, you know, adding product and severity codes, uh, uh, doing some of the things that we're talking about in mid-year number two. The next component of this is then data storage. This is the idea around enterprise data management that, that we've had a lot of conversation around in this room, whether that's a data warehouse, a data lake, but some common platform where all of the information is, a stored, is stored and available across stovepipes as opposed to just being available within stovepipes. The next piece is where I think there is more clarity, and that is what are the analytical tools that we add on top of this enterprise data capability? And there's a lot of open source tools out there. I, I didn't include it in this uh, slide deck, but uh, our CIO provided it. There's literally hundreds of different open source tools that can be customized for our use. We're obviously using SAS now. There's a lot of interest in R and Python, and how does the RAM system sit on top of that? And then lastly, this, this next piece, I think it's easy to conflate with the analytical tools piece, but it's really the results of the analysis that we want, taking the time to form the use cases, the analytical questions that we want to answer and how we want to use the enterprise data to answer them. So in our three-step process, step one is creating a strategy that is essentially this picture or something like this picture in the implementation plan to achieve it. Step two is tackling one, two, or three of these use cases on the right-hand column, and then step three would be pursuing a multi-year funding effort to implement this vision. I promised I'd spend just a couple of minutes on mid-year number two, the use cases that we could pursue now. These are some ideas that staff has had that were included in your mid-year package. We've come up with three. Uh, uh, one would be automated coding, so product code and severity code assignment to retailer data using machine learning. Uh, this could provide a framework for getting initial classification on data that currently are beyond our capacity to clerically code. Um, a second use case would be data matching, connecting recalls in DCM cases and CPS RMS, uh, so that it would be clear when looking at an incident whether it involved a recalled product. Uh, this could accelerate our predictive modeling capabilities uh, as a recall is a critical outcome. And then the third uh, proposed use case is data translation, translating product information in CPS RMS to HTS codes to allow for incident data to be a signal for inspection for import surveillance. Uh, we think pursuing a limited number of use cases using artificial intelligence tools for deployment and initial results could be accomplished uh, by the end of this year or early next year. These pilot scale results would then inform the larger data strategy. I've put together a timeline. Uh, for how this could all unfold if this is something that the Commission was interested in pursuing. Uh, this uh, summer, we would initiate development of the Enterprise Data Strategy and Implementation Plan through Mid-Year Project 1. We would simultaneously initiate one to three use cases to pilot this technology and demonstrate results. Uh, by September, um, I would think we would want to include at least some initial startup funding in our next uh, OMB budget request. We may not have a uh, complete fidelity on what the final plan looks like, but I think a startup request would be in order. Uh, by December, January timeframe, I think we would want our use cases deployed and see the initial results from those, what's working, what's not working. 
Uh, by February, we'd review dis and discuss and approve the enterprise data strategy and implementation plan, the big picture, and I would want heading into the April timeframe to start pricing out that plan in time for our budget formulation process that will run through the summer and ultimately uh, result in a, a, a larger funding request in the FY 2022 uh, OMB budget. Uh, I would note that the mid-year next year uh, could present an opportunity to sort of get started, if you will. So that's a lot of information. I know it's a longer briefing than we normally give at the beginning of a mid-year, but I will pause there and uh, over to you for any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and with that, we will begin our 10-minute rounds of questions, and I will begin the questioning. Um, Jay, let me say, first of all, uh, thank you to you and your team for taking the time to putting the, for putting this together and to coming up with this these two projects um, for the agency and consideration by the commission. Um, I would like to recognize that committee that you put together. Maybe you could just tell who was on that committee so that they can all. Yes, uh, let, I wrote that down because I don't want to leave anybody off. This was a terrific team. Um, Jim Jaholski, uh, Steve Hanway, George Borlase, Dwayne Boniface, Jim Rolfe, Steve Fabry, Eddie Ahmad, Adam Graham and uh, James Baker were all uh, instrumental in, in working over several months to put this together. Thank you very much. Uh, I have several questions about it. Um, and you alluded to it be in your opening comments just with regards to informing one informs two and two informs one. But more broadly, in the 2020 budget discussion, there were some initiatives and some amendments. How do these, how does project one and project two tie into those two amendments? Right, so th this is around kind of who do we need to implement the plan, and, and I, I didn't do an organizational assessment, so let me make that clear. This is simply my views in, in the context of these projects. It would seem to me that in pursuing this data strategy, specifically mid-year one, that that would ultimately inform the requests that were put forward in the FY 2020 budget. What kind of people do we need to hire to implement uh, this strategy? I don't know that we need to bring in folks to help us refine the strategy further. Thank you. Um, I want to just turn to your uh, graphic on slide 11 um, with regards to that first column uh, under project one where you talk about the different sources where that inform the agency with regards to incident data um, will will project number one or two for that matter um, make it clear because I've often thought about this are we missing opportunities to find other data I, I you know I have been a proponent of retailer reporting I think that that is a very good source of information and data if we can get that to a manageable where we're getting meaningful data, and as you talked about uh, in your comments. But would this, would project number one inform us of any potential other data sources? I think as envisioned, Chairman, the project, it could. We could add that to the scope if that was something the commission wanted to do. The way that I think we were thinking about it was really this, this data ingestion box. The issue isn't so much are there other data sources that we might want to add. We know there are, right? There's retailer reporting that's been talked about. There is the urgent care center data that we've talked about. There's probably a dozen more that I'm not familiar that we've talked about. But the, the stumbling block is always the same. We don't have the capacity to deal with it. So I think what we want to do is try to position the agency with the tools and technology to be able to ingest data, whatever it may be, uh, and whenever that data may become available. So I, I think there'll always be an evolution in that. I wouldn't limit it to just sort of the soup du jour, you know, that we're focused on today. Um, I would think that uh, the idea here is, is whatever we come up with, we want it to be scalable and flexible for the future. Thank you. Um, in the well, I'll say the fourth column over, the under data analysis tools and examples of some of the uh, open source uh, products that are out there. You mentioned we're using SAS, but can you just distinguish how we're using SAS now versus what conceptually I think would be the result of, of Project 1 and 2? 
Well, so I, I'll give you a cursory, but we may want to bring Mr. Hanway up for a, a detailed uh, uh, description of that. I, I think at the end of the day, the, the, the SaaS tools are proprietary tools, and it's the, it's the amount of customization that we can do is limited. But if you'd like a more uh, fulsome answer, I think I'd need to defer to Mr. Hanway. I think that would be helpful. And I think for me, my understanding was, and maybe it, it isn't correct, but that currently the SaaS requires someone there and it's a very manual process to develop the rules. And I, I just would like to understand this versus what we currently have. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so SAS is, is useful for a number of things, and we've gotten some tools to get, get some uh, greater capacity for handling unstructured data. But it's still built in a way that was built for the many. And I think the, the big shift in our mentality as we got together with this group is thinking about things that were built for us rather than built for the many. Because we do have uh, sort of unique data issues. We have unique organizational requirements. Um, a lot of the things that have to do with data man uh, management of, of unstructured data is about improving your batting average. But our standards are much higher than that. We want near total accuracy when it comes to how we classify and categorize data. And what we want is something that could give us some confidence that we, we could get to that place. Um, many places when they get data in uh, can view it only as an asset. For us, it always comes with a certain responsibility to know what's in it and to take action if action is required. So we want something that can signal to us when action would be required. And we want things that can help us with the, with the often very laborious task of getting things classified and categorized correctly. And we think some of these open source tools can not only help us with some of those problems, at least in these use cases, but also teach us how to apply those solutions elsewhere because they are open source, which means we can look into the code and look at the approaches that they use and then apply them elsewhere. Thank you very much. Um, and that brings me to my next question, and any one of you can answer that. But just in terms of, because you mentioned one of our challenges is that we can't use these open source projects or products without some customization. Maybe you could just expand on that a little bit, the challenge for the agency. Well, and, and again, I would also uh, look to Steve a little bit, but I, I think in just from the project manager perspective and bringing this team together and really talking about these sticky analytical problems that we have, um, the, the questions are very specific. Uh, and the out-of-the-box technologies uh, are a little bit coarse. And we really need to bring in folks not only with the tools that they're able to customize, but also with the sort of data science skill sets in order to help us define how to organize these, organize our data and also organize our analytics. So that's really what I was trying to get out in the larger context of the briefing, but Steve may want to add to that with the specific challenges he has. Yeah, I, I think the thought was, well, we, what we could say is we could ask for FTEs and try to bring people in who would only practice in this area, or we could leverage the, the expertise of people who are already experts doing it, have them work on problems that we already have, and then allow the people who are here to learn to do it uh, by looking into their solutions. I think kind of where we've been with SAS is to say, let's make as much progress learning all the tricks that you can do with, with some of these, these more advanced uh, modules uh, kind of in your spare time or as time allows. What We're not getting nearly the sufficient time we need to get as far enough, fast enough, as I think organizationally we want to be. And I think this was a way to accelerate where we were headed, but also what seems to have become often the most common and best practice in this area. These seems to be the tools that people who have a choice of tools seem to choose most, and that's why we thought we might follow their example. Thank you. Um, Jay, I just wanted to mention briefly, or ask a question. You, you've mentioned a couple of times learning by doing. And what's the practical implications for the agency with, when we're learning while doing? So the good news is if we're able to demonstrate quick wins, the learning by doing, I think, helps us make our case in terms of more resources, uh, that we have some tangible results to take to OMB and Congress and say, hey, there's a new set of tools, there's a new set of techniques, and then justifying that approach. The flip side of that is learning by doing means occasionally taking some risks that don't pan out. Um, we might find that some of these tools are not as robust or not as informative as we had hoped. And I think it would be better to know that for a few hundred thousand dollars rather than a few million dollars. 
Thank you very much. My time before I expire, I'll turn to Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me say, first of all, that uh, this sounds exciting. It sounds like it's new, innovative, creative, dynamic, and exciting, uh, and it may well be, but uh, I'd like at least to start with a couple of sort of fundamental questions. Um, first of all, Jay, you said other agencies don't have our data problems, but I could think that NHTSA would have similar problems. I could think that FDA, at least with medical devices, would have similar problems. Uh, what is it I'm missing? What is it that's unique about this agency that creates a need for something like this? So we, we desperately wanted to find an analog of someone that was using these tools in a way that's similar to the way that we're using them. And certainly data ingestion, data cat categorization, there are similarities. So it's not a it's not a universal issue. And I'll let Steve expand on this, but I think the one thing that we've learned when we start talking to other agencies is the threshold for our level of accuracy is so high. And, uh, and to simplify, for a lot of agencies, sort of a, the 80% solution is good enough, identifying 80% of the problem. For us, we're really looking for the, the needle in the haystack and sometimes the needle in multiple haystacks. I mean, did you want to expand on that challenge? Yeah, I think the, um, the piece that's unique for us, I think retailer reporting is an example of that, where I think people would be very willing to transmit to us large volumes of data that include a lot of uh, sort of narrative description that's completely unstructured. People use language in many ways. Um, there's no grammatic governance. There's no spelling governance. Um, so uh, you can do some things searching for keywords and things that, that, that can make you find a lot of things, but you still miss a lot of things through that approach. What we want to do is get something that we trust as much as we would trust someone going through record by record. And we haven't found other places that have both that issue of needing to scrutinize it that way, but also with the volume that we have. Um, and, and that, for example, is even why some of the private sector people that are sending us things are sending us far more than we really want them to, because even their training their models can only do it in, in, in to such a degree of specificity. They, they still have to have to grab a lot that that we don't really need. Well, well, you've identified one in particular, which is retailer reporting, and uh, it's something I've been skeptical about for the very reason you mentioned that I look at the years that we've been involved in this, and I say how many recalls really. Uh, were triggered in whole or in part, and it's really hard to pin that down. So I could see retailer reporting being one unique aspect, but I'm, I'm having, I, and I could also understand that other agencies may not be doing what we're proposing to do, but I'm just having trouble seeing that other agencies have similar problems that we don't, aside from something called retailer reporting. But I guess the next question I would ask is, somewhere somebody sat down and said, we gotta do something because we got a serious problem. Uh, what was the serious problem? What was the thing that lit people's minds about the need to do something like this? Because as I'm looking through some of these, uh, I, I'm saying, you know, like tying uh, recalls to other systems, that, that doesn't seem to me to be that massive a challenge. It, it's a challenge, but not that massive a challenge. So could you sort of enlighten me as what were the catalysts for this developed? I can jump in. Um, the integrated product team is an example that we've described in the past uh, and where we have this uh, group of uh, subject matter experts reviewing incoming data reports to signal early on that we have something of concern to trigger some action going. Uh, and I think we all realize that is not a sustainable model if the, the volume issues that we've described, uh, I think we have a new term, anomaly detection, but the, the idea there is that how are we finding out about things early and taking action early? That is the problem in my mind that we need to solve, and I think we have examples of that through this larger strategy to try to, uh, to get at that. But if there's one thing that, that I uh, believe uh, we could solve and, and can get some tools and help beyond you know, this massive uh, effort by subject matter experts, I think that would be worth doing. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned one other thing that is a constant source of concern to me, and it's if you've followed me over the years, it's something I've always raised with IT, which is the hazards of customizing. 
because what I've seen at several organizations is they've developed, for lack of a better term, some new enterprise, some new data analysis system, and the next thing you know, they've customized it, and then there are two people in the world that know how to work it, and one of them gets mad and walks off, and the other one we're afraid getting hit by a truck. Uh, so I guess one of the things that does concern me is the degree of customization. And Jay, you said that at some point, uh, even if we're customizing it, we're training our own staff so that they will be able, we'll have a large inventory of staff capable of running this system. Because to the extent that we're having a high quality consultant, high quality consultants, first of all, charge higher prices sometimes or they leave. So is, is there some way of making sure we don't get stuck with the one person we're worried about getting hit by a truck? Well, and I'll let Steve expand on this answer, but I would begin by saying uh, the customization that, as I see it, is really on the far right-hand side of the picture that I described. It's, it's the use cases and analytical questions that we're trying to solve that are likely going to have unique definitions and answers. The overall architecture and tool set that we're recommending, I think that would be pretty, pretty. I, don't, I wouldn't want to say standard, but I think that would be fairly ubiquitous. I don't know that it's going to be something incredibly different than what other agencies are doing on that side of it. So I, I think obviously we would want to structure the contract in such a way where the entire process wasn't so custom that we couldn't manage it. Uh, but I, I don't know that th this isn't the, the item that would keep me up at night. I mean, Steve, do you want to? Yeah, I, I think, so we've talked about customized in terms of how they're deployed, but things like R and Python are actually very commonly used. And the open source nature means that anyone can look in and see the work that was done. And if they have a familiarity with R or Python, then they're able to see this is the code that does this, this is what does that, which means you could replace people who are working on it. So that, that's one of the nice things about it. The other piece of it is they've also come into favor a lot in academia because they are also inexpensive or free. And so uh, in that sense, then you've got generations coming in who are learning how to use them. And those are the people that we see ourselves likely to hire over the years. Well, you did talk about SaaS, but there, a lot of the SaaS stuff is proprietary. So if we want to use it, we have to pay for it. Would we n not get into issues of this high quality consultant saying, well, this is my proprietary software. I'll customize it for you, but I'm going to own it. My understanding that the, the approach is to have someone develop a strategy who would be independent of the deployment so that they would not be in a position to be rewarded for whatever advice that they provide. Um, one other question. Um, I, it sounds like you've thought this through, but if we start this, and Jay, you were saying it's, and, and I agree with you, when you start big projects, you do drill dry holes, and, and you just need to be prepared for that. But do we have a point or several points along the line where we say, okay, it's not worth continuing? In other words, several breakpoints uh, that are built in for assessing whether this is turning out to be useful? Well, I uh, we absolutely will have to build those points in. I don't want to overstate where we're at. Um, right now, slide 11 is, is uh, I hesitate to use the word cartoon, it's just, it's just a vision of what could be. I think once we had mid-year number one in that implementation plan, we would need to um, specify specific gating criteria for moving forward, but we're nine to 12 months away from knowing what those would be. I'll just say slide 11 was the first time I looked at something and I said, I think I kind of maybe vaguely understand it. So uh, uh, especially sort of the d different data sources and integrating them. And I, I realize we've had issues with siloed information all along. Uh, it does at some point uh, raise the question of how critical is it to have these integrated. If I were a manager coming to work, uh, how would my life be different assuming this uh, succeeded uh, and it worked well? What, what would be different about my life? Well, I think uh, the integrated teams is one place where we've imagined a different world, where instead of relying on people to catch everything by reviewing each individual case, we have something that, that would review language in, in a way similar to a human would and take notice of the things that we would want a human to take note of. And so then that would provide a signal to us that there's something here that requires further attention. You know, if our current state is at roughly three out of four pieces of data that come to us, do not require additional action, that rather than having discover that by going through them manually, you have something that's able to do some of that sorting for you. So all the time that you're spending looking at the data you won't act on can be deployed to other activity. 
Uh, thank you. My time's up. And again, I'm not opposed to this. I'm just struggling to understand it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to the staff for the thoughtful presentation. So I guess, Mr. Ray, this is probably better directed at you. Let's just say we do all this and it's all funded and it's all implemented. What does the American consumer get for this investment? Meaning, how is the agency, what's the return on investment and what are the tangible actions the agency is able to take that can be tied directly back to this work such that it's worth this investment relative to other things? Because obviously this is, this is an all, all relative decision. This is not like, hey, we can just take whatever money we get just for this and it's all free. We're going to have to not spend it on something else. Uh, sure. So um, we're talking one and two, right? Just, I... Well, one and two and then old, because one and two are down payments. Sure. Yeah. If we accept this now, we're basically saying we are buying into a system that will require significant resources in the future, and we're sort of going down that road. So we have to make that decision sure. in the next couple of weeks. So I'm curious to know if we accept that, pay that down payment, we buy into this plan, recognizing it might move in a bunch of different directions, but there's a vision in a certain direction overall. I'm just trying to understand what is the end benefit in terms of the agency's output. Sure, I, and I, I, um, I categorize them as um, being able to make decisions quicker. Uh, so I think, obviously, when we're reliant on these human processes to review incident data and make decisions, uh, there's a limitations. Number of bodies, you know, if data grows and continues to grow, which, you know, there there's obviously more sources out there that we're not tapping into, um, you know, we've got a challenge there on it's not scalable. So, uh, and the impact being we find out, we take action sooner, and we resolve hazards earlier in the process before more consumers are affected by it. So I think if we hit the sweet spot on this and we can make these tools work, I think that would be an, uh, an outcome that I would uh, expect to see from this process. So I, I can accept the idea that we would potentially learn about a hazard earlier, but since so much of our authorities involve, certainly on the recalls, just talk about recalls, for instance, sure. requires individual cooperation from a recalling firm, knowing about it earlier doesn't necessarily mean there ain't going to be any more willing, one, to do a recall, or two, to provide the level of remedies that we believe are necessary, correct? It's yeah. a, I can get the time factor, but I'm not seeing that it's going to give us any additional leverage in terms of our ability to actually effectuate a better recall. Yeah, I, I don't... Uh time piece I take, I'm not sure it changes the interaction uh, on, on how we deal with recalls, with the exception of maybe we have other data that we're not currently getting, and that that data helps in uh, getting to a uh, cooperative corrective action. Got it, but I think Mr. Hoffman said this plan as currently constructed is not contemplating at this moment that additional data, correct? That's, that's correct. Okay, and yep. so then let's put recalls aside, so it, it may end up having sooner engagement of a negotiation but no additional leverage, how about rulemaking? How would this tangibly impact our ability to uh, affect hazards through, through mandatory standards? Um, you know, if we're able to get better eyes on what's happening, I, I think some of the examples I've seen in the past on... Uh, on some of the retailer reporting data, maybe didn't trigger an action uh, on a corrective action plan, but were helpful in developing the 104 uh, standards and requirements. Um, and so, you know, they weren't, you know, injuries or deaths that were triggered by this, but there were issues that were identified through that process. So potentially that could feed into any uh, regulation work or, or uh, updates to uh, 104 rules. Okay, so 104 is obviously, we have that additional yep. leverage, though. We're back to leverage. We have additional leverage where we can move forward in the absence of uh, industry cooperation. What about on 7 and 9 rulemaking? Do you see a tangible benefit on 7 and 9 rulemaking? I, I, I would just put them all into, we have potentially more information. I'm not sure that it gives us, uh, it, it would depend whether there was leverage, additional leverage by the data. I think I think it just helps to refine the data that we have to make. Okay, and the same answer for civil penalties? Uh, yep, being the same. 
Okay, thanks. And then let me, and thank you, that is helpful. And so Mr. Hoffman and I guess Mr. Hanway, I want to turn to you on this, probably Mr. Hanway. Do we have enough data? Do we get enough actual data in, volume of data, to make use of this? Meaning, do we, is there enough for a statistical value for us to actually try to implement all of these tools? Yeah. Um, I think even today, our current state, there is stuff uh, beyond our cap capacity to clerically code that comes to us. And that's why one of those use cases was to try to do that immediately. Because the concern would be that that's some of the stuff that's hardest to get eyes on. And we would really like to have a high degree of understanding of what's coming to us um, to signal anything that requires action. Got it. So you feel comfortable making statistical projections, though, off of the data that we have now. You just don't have the capability to do the coding to do the that type of statistical projections? Now, when I think about projections, then I get into the world of the probabilistic data mm -hmm. versus the non-probabilistic mm -hmm. data. So I, I don't see this as mainly something we're, we're looking into because of NICE. I think it really is more because of the other incident data. Although if we do get into the world applying this outside my domain, places like import surveillance, where there's enormous volumes to deal with in terms of customs border uh, data, um, there are many places, I guess, that are rich environments to, to use it. I think just in terms of, of the way that we'd actually use it. Again, I, I'm thinking mostly signal detection for the incident data, and my sense is that's also where we're thinking in terms of import surveillance, where we're just trying to do a better job of identifying shipments that ought to be inspected. Got it. And then probably for the two of you, so within the last five years, we had, the agency obviously had a hearing on data. We heard from a lot of different folks, both at the federal level and in private sector. People were hawking their products. People were explaining their success stories. And my sense of the collective takeaway from staff was, eh, we're sort of doing all that. We're in pretty good shape. For, was that an accurate assessment of the takeaway from that data hearing and all the work that went into looking at the comments and everything? Or is this a direct result from that hearing or the work that occurred around that period? I don't know if I'd characterize that hearing as central to this. I think there were some other um, elements uh, that we had to consider. I think it was both some of our, our concerns about the, the integrated team process um, and its scalability, and also this sense that, that it didn't seem like we ought to be in a position where we didn't want to invite in further data simply because we had limitations on our ability to process, especially when there's so many people outside telling us that, that there are good solutions that exist and not wanting to completely turn a deaf ear to that, that message that, that there may be ways to cope with larger volumes of data, even if it is very unstructured and very hard to work with. Got it. So it sounds like what you're saying is, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that the, the sort of continued calls to expand our data sources might have been a trigger for looking at our processes to realize how we could actually do better because we didn't want to just add data if we couldn't actually do anything with it. I think coping with much larger volumes requires bigger solutions and, and greater investments, certainly. Got it. And then, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Ray. You look I, like you're going to say something. I would just something. add, um, even if we don't uh, add additional, if we just status quo, we cannot continue to, to do this manual process. We need tools that Got help it. identify those. Yeah, and I hear that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, so in terms of lessons learned, and I want to pick up some of the stuff that Commissioner Adler was talking about, we obviously went through this with the RAM system, where we went the whole route of sort of hiring somebody, and then they own the proprietary technology, and then we ended up getting captured by that, and then we decided to bring it in-house, and then we realized that we had uh, expected to get returns in terms of specific steps that never really occurred or it cost a lot more money or what, they, what we ended up getting out of our investment ended up being relatively pedestrian in terms of what we were hoping for. Are there lessons learned from that process so that we don't go down this road and end up in the same place where we overpromise and under, under deliver? Yes, I think mid-year number two. Uh, that's that's the hedge against exactly that problem. Not to litigate RAM, but that's where we were really trying to start building the picture and then decided the picture that we built it, we were too captive to it. Um, so I want to, the lesson learned is be methodical. What's the strategy? What is the technical implementation plan to implement that strategy? What are we getting ourselves into? Should we decide to proceed? And can we demonstrate any any results for small dollars before we make that commitment. I would I would just want to 
recharacterize what Mr. Adler said. I don't think we're making a and you as well. I don't think we're making a commitment to to start this multi million dollar initiative. I think we're making a commitment to um, do some additional research, kick the tires, demonstrate some results, and make a decision next year. My time has expired, so I can't rebut that. But thank you. <laughs> we'll wait forty minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Biaco. Thank you. Um, Jay, this is terrific uh, to you and everybody who worked on this. Thank you. Um, I think we should have been talking about this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and maybe it would have um, you know, foreclosed some of the things that my fellow commissioners are talking about. But I'm ready to do a happy dance that we're at this point right now. So going forward, um, I, I think that this we need to move on this. We are so far behind. And I think this is a legi legitimate place to start. I, I think there's a lot of good things here. And one thing that I heard you say that you know, made me a little nervous is, when I think we all know this, is we don't have the capacity now to deal with the data we're getting, whether it's retail reporting or anything else. So we're, we aren't dealing with it, and we're not getting the benefit of it. So take, keep continuing to take in data um, under the current structure is not going to do this agency or the American consumer any good. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think our concern has been taking on more data without having the, the ability to process and deal with it is problematic, for sure. Okay. And, and I, I think we all know that. And, and I, I appreciate Mr. Hanway's comment about, you know, our level of accuracy is, is high. Of course it's high. But right now, we don't have anything. So at this point, anything that we can get that moves this ball forward is, is a good thing. And I, I would encourage everyone in this room, including my fellow commissioners, not to let the perfect get in way of the good. Um, because this needs to be done. And um, it needs to be done forthwith. Sorry, it's a legal term. I could come up with anything on the fly. Um, on that note, are you? So, so I didn't completely understand um, mid to, mid year one and mid year two, the two projects here. They're not they're not mutually exclusive, right? We're going to do those together, is what you're proposing, is, or is am I wrong? So they they could be mutually exclusive. I think there is synergy between the two. Was the point I was trying to make. Um, and this goes to hedging some of the risks that Commissioner Kay was talking about. Um, I'm confident we can bring in somebody to come up with a, a plan and even an implementation plan. But I'd like to have a second contractor do some demonstration while that's ongoing and have that completed to inform the plan as it's going, this, as it's going, and at the end point. Okay, because what I what I would what I would hate to do, but you know, beggars can't be choosers. But what I would hate to do is wait another yet six to nine months to get to get answers, and then we have to wait another six months or however long it takes um, this particular body to, to vote. I, I I think that we're so far behind the curve that it would do th this agency justice to do them both simultaneously. And as you point out, we can learn by doing. You make tweaks along the way. That's how any project works. Would, am, I, am I right? Am I off? Just to put a fine point on it, the, the sense of urgency from the dais has been expressed in multiple meetings. Uh, these two projects were staged in response to that. Okay. Uh, we understand that people, plans are great, but we want to see results. Got Thank it. you. And, and do we, I, this is probably, I probably know the answer to this, but I, I wrote it down. Um, do we have somebody identified who would head this up right now? I mean, I know it's not, that's not set in stone, but to get this moving? I think we would we would use our existing organizational structure. I mean, these are IT projects uh, that would be uh, led by our uh, project managers and IT. But the reason I I form this team in an ad hoc way is to bring in the program perspective and bring in the analytical perspective. And I think that the folks that I named and there's that's probably an expanding list are vested in this now, and mm -hmm. I think they want to be involved. Sure. So we're gonna it'll be a cross uh, program initiative for sure. One of you mentioned, um, and I don't remember who, but um, you know it's a labor intensive issue, and we don't have a lot of people. So while I agree with you that the people who are invested should stay, I do think that we need to bring in. Well, everybody spread then. We all know that. So we need to bring in. I think Mr. Hanway, you mentioned that bring in some FTEs to actually fortify that effort. Correct. That was one option you could consider. So if you didn't, if you didn't have ex external parties building the use case, you could hire people and designate their their tasks to be to be building this use case. We would just have to make sure that as we put together operating plans, that we didn't then assign them to something else. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's important. And and just to address some of Commissioner Kay's questions. Um, 
I, I think, uh, the way I understand this, um, you know, the, the, the importance and what the American consumer gets here by, by moving into this century is that we can start predicting some of these hazards before the injury occurs. So we can get to a recall before the injury or uh, before more injuries occur. Do I understand that correctly? I mean, the, I mean, information is power. The more information we have and the sooner we have it, we can go to a manufacturer, for example, and say, hey, we see this. Do you see it? And if you don't see it, we see it. And we can use that information to uh, move our mission forward and to enforce the laws and, and the regulations that we are put in charge of. Yeah, I, I think uh, in May or two, that second item, the data matching and that predictive modeling is trying to get some experience with that. We've, we've had that desire for a long period of time to be able to try to connect. Hey, we've seen a hazard. It's similar. We see something close. Should we start looking at it now? Uh, and so I think that aims to get at that, uh, that, that capability. Far as uh, far as money, so if I look at this list of things on here, I've got thirteen things, and and certainly not going to suggest that one is more important than the other, but you know we have here the enterprise data. You have a, a number associated with it, and you have some, some different things that apply to what we're discussing here. What if we took all the money that's available at the mid-year and put it into this plan? Doesn't that move us forward? No. It doesn't. I, I, Tell me why. Sure. And it's an important question, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, we don't want to be in the ready, shoot, aim mode. Totally and, agree. And I think that in the market research we've done, the importance of, and just the discussion we've had here today, there's been some really good questions we need to think through. Um, what is the enterprise strategy? What is the implementation plan? And then do we all agree with it? And uh, it's not how much money we can put on it, it's how much money is enough to put on it to get a good result. And I'm comfortable with the estimates that we have here okay. for now. And we'll probably come back with a bigger estimate if people get excited about this nine months from now. Okay, terrific. And what, what market re research? I've heard you refer to that a couple times. Can you tell me a little bit more? Sure. Um, and I'm going to uh, intentionally be a little bit opaque so as not to bias the procurement process. Um, but we have done market research in terms of speaking with vendors to understand what the capabilities are that exist in the marketplace and how they're applying those capabilities to other agencies. We've done market research in terms of talking to vendors that have been tasked with coming up with strategy and implementation plans for other agencies with, with similar problems, maybe not identical problems, but similar problems. And we've also done market research in terms of talking to customers of those vendors and other vendors. Um, I guess I can reveal organizations. We've talked to NIH, for example, that's done some, they've got a lot of money. Uh, they've done some really exciting uh, work in terms of applying some of these tools. Uh, what have they learned? Where where have they drilled some dry wells? To hey, use they've spent wrappers? the money. They can share those things. They Just can, them. yes. Uh, they can share them uh, to the extent that they're applicable. But Gets again, us I further. would go back to this. So we do have some unique our, our use case piece is unique. I, I think I overstated the customization piece. The questions we're trying to answer are incredibly unique. Okay. I think um, it would be helpful, I'm just going to throw this out there to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking for everybody else, but I'm guessing that if um, those who are the um, people in charge or the experts to come in and just show us, put up a little demonstration. This is how this works. This is how this would work. This is what this would do. I think would help inform at least this little group up here and everybody um, who will be involved going forward so that we're all speaking on the same, uh, on the same page. Because I can tell by the questions up here and your comments that we're all operating on different technology knowledge levels. And so I think, you know, again, information and education is very important here so that we can make good decisions sooner. Um, that's all I have right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. The discussion so far about the path forward on expanding CPSC's data capability uh, and, and, and analytics capability is encouraging. I think it's an important discussion. It's something that's come up uh, previously in the context, for instance, of expanding the retail reporting program in the context of taking a look at some of that epi data that, that drives um, 
our, our epidemiological work and ability to spot emerging hazards and, and, and actual hazards with, with product in the marketplace. Um, from time to time, and I'm not quoting anybody here, uh, but, but you get uh, excuses and concerns along the lines of, it's just too much data. We can't, we, we, we don't know how to process that. I think in 2019, that that's no longer a valid excuse, given the amount of, uh, of, of, of applications, tools, resources that exist for handling large data sets. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing a bit of that today, but I'm glad that it's out on the table, and I, I really think this is at the heart of, of the discussion. Um, expanding our data capabilities, bringing in large data sets, particularly when we're talking about spotting anomalies and trends, even if the data set gives the agency a better sense of what normal looks like, then you've got a richer basis on which to spot even the smallest anomaly so that you're seeing the smoke before the fire and you're able to get out ahead of an issue before it manifests itself into a full-blown crisis. I think with the speed with which the global supply chain is operating right now, with Asian manufacturing and the ability to get stuff into the United States, not just through the traditional you know, seaport container uh, uh, distribution models, but via e-commerce and surpassing our ports and sort of directly into commerce, increasingly we're going to see a situation where uh, where product that, that was an idea just a couple weeks ago is all of a sudden everywhere. And therefore, our ability to spot and, and, and stay ahead of that curve is, is important. So I, I think we need to expand the agency's capabilities, and that includes uh, taking a look at our systems, our human capital, and our expertise. Uh, really encouraged to hear the discussion today. You know, right now, we're struggling under the current system. Um, not just to make sense of the data, but to keep that data confidential. Um, so I, I think structural reforms are needed. Uh, I think this is a longer conversation. I think it's something that we're not going to solve uh, in, in, in one pass at, at, at making decisions with respect to unexecuted mid-year uh, dollars in, in, in 2019. Um, but that's as good a place as any to start. So I, I appreciate the recommendations. I, I want to pivot and talk about something a little bit more discreet. Uh, one of the top complaints that I hear from staff is uh, concerns about the reliability and functionality of the agency's VDI system. Um, it's a clunky system, it's temperamental, and it's having a material effect on, uh, material negative effect on staff morale and the ability to execute CPSC's important safety mission. Um, when I've had an opportunity to talk to staff in the field, uh, you know, they find that often they're kicked off of the VDI system that there's a direct loss of productivity associated with that. And, you know, I'm talking about inspectors and compliance staff that's, that's out there across the country doing the important work of the agency. Uh, and it's something that we've experienced here at headquarters. Uh, when staff at headquarters is kicked off of VDI, the agency grinds to a halt. This happened most recently on uh, March 7th of, of, of this year when the agency essentially went dark for more than 24 hours. Um, and that's not the first time that this has happened. My, my question is, uh, because I'm hearing directly from the rank and file staff and I'm hearing from CPSC supervisors, I'm hearing from folks on the seventh floor, and I, I, I would candidly include myself on this group, that, that it's a problem, that it's a top concern, that it's demoralizing when it happens. Um, where does addressing VDI and improving the system reliability fall in the staff priorities that you've listed here? Uh, that is not listed in one of the projects that is before the commission. Okay. That wouldn't be something that would be covered in uh, the IT assessment? No. Okay. Um, my, my next question would be, you know, to the extent that alternatives to VDI exist, uh, what those alternatives might be, what the cost associated with transitioning to a more reliable system may be, um, you know, wh whether there's been sort of a, a cost-benefit examination of that kind of transition. I, I, I'm assuming it's not cheap. We uh, definitely did the benefit-cost analysis to transition to VDI, uh, and I'm, I don't have that information right in front of me, but I, that's something we'd be happy to brief the commission on. Okay. I'd love a follow-up briefing on sure. that uh, when, when you're ready. Uh, my next question had to do with uh, project number two. Uh, you mentioned uh, how AI could be leveraged to help um, improve the enterprise data analytics implementation and, and putting together a, a, a pilot study to use machine learning and AI to benefit 
any number of mission critical items. Um, what's the agency currently doing with respect to AI? Is it technology that we're deploying in any way right now? I would say there, there are things that can be iterative, but they're very manual. So it's, it's very hard to say that it's really the machine doing the learning so much as it's, it's that you can train the machine. And so it's still very intensive in terms of training. I'd say many of the solutions look like that. The hope is, though, that once you've built something that's, that's uh, very mature in terms of its training, then it's doing more of the work than the person training it. For right now, it's almost a one for one in terms of the time you invest. If you were to go through things manually, you might take a similar amount of time in many cases as it does to train the machine to get to a similar place. So we are currently deploying AI at CPSE? In a limited way, I would say yes, but, but, but not to the extent that I think um, we'd like to. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe we'll go for a second round of questions. Um, so I'll start that second round. Um, I want to just clarify a couple points. I think that in one of the conversations, we talked about the uniqueness of this agency. And I think if you look at us versus, say, Anitza, we have 15,000 types of consumer products. That's a far different than just a car. And I understand there's a variety of cars, but that's one of our challenges is the scope of our work and our jurisdiction. And so that is a challenge. There, therefore, is more data coming in. Um, Dwayne, something you said is of concern to me, and I'd like you to just expand on it a little bit. With regards to the integrated teams and the sustainability of those integrated teams, can you comment on that and um, how this, these two initiatives at least, and, and before you get to your question, I just want to, because I want to clarify something. Project one and two of this mid-year is only, I, I think what it will provide to the agency and to us as the decision makers, the art of the possible. It's to understand and to give us a roadmap. It doesn't commit us to any future actions. You know, we may, you know, but it, it informs us and it gives us a strategy forward. But to your point, Jay, and I, I think this is important, that ends with that project one, and any deployment of a strategy is a s separate initiative, and it's not tied into uh, the contractor that we're working or we would work with in the in the first project. I think that's important too, because I think Bob raises, excuse me, Commissioner Adler raises. You know, valid issues. They're, they're, you know, salespeople and they want to sell us their products. And to keep those independent, I think, is critical. Um, I'll go back to Dwayne now. Um, yeah, it, when, when I say uh, it's not sustainable, um, I think as, as good as our teams are and as uh, highly qualified as our experts are at looking at this data, we still don't catch everything. And that is the part where we need, we need help. We need some tools. Uh, we need improvements in that that I do believe will help uh, in that area. Uh, and then the data will continue to grow just by, you know, the fact of where we are, the way, uh, the way consumers interact with, uh, with products, how they purchase products, all those kind of things are, have changed over the years. And, you know, I think it's one of these where we need to, uh, modernize how we look at and view that incident data and process that. And that, that's what I meant by not, not sustainable for over the long time. Thank you. The, um, we talked a little bit about how this would benefit the consumer. Um, the other area where I think this could be beneficial is informing voluntary standards, more data, more incident data, understanding that incident data and having the chance to review it. I think, and, and Dwayne, if you could comment on that, it would be inf informative to the voluntary standards process. Sure, and, I, and I, the example I was using, 104, you can translate that right right to a voluntary standard. Uh, you know, we get we get uh, data that may not trigger the, trigger a substantial products hazard uh, threshold, but there is problems that we identify and improvements that we could see through that, and we can make those recommendations to the standards bodies for sure. Thank you. I'm um, going to turn away from project one and two in, um, in the plan that was given to us and I would like perhaps Steve or 
uh, Dwayne, to comment on NCARES. This has come up before, and I think it would be beneficial to all of us to get an explanation of NCARES and how that would improve uh, our information here at the agency. Yeah, as, as an, uh, an agency, we have some history collecting exposure data, but it's typically been one-offs, that we identify a single product where we feel like it's necessary to reach out directly to consumers about the, the products they have and what they use. Um, and then that goes through the entire cycle of uh, identifying the funding, you know, preparing a statement of work specific to that product, getting it paperwork, going through PRA and getting that kind of clearance for it, getting the data back, doing the analysis. And I think if this sort of recognizes that that might be an activity that we do or will want to do with some regularity. So we start building something that allows us to do that on sort of an ongoing basis for things that are on our horizon to where we think that kind of data would be useful. What it also does is takes advantage of economies of scale. So much of the cost born of doing any kind of nationwide survey is the time you spend in getting uh, things sampled and getting cooperation from a respondent. And if you're doing a single product, let's say, for example, it was like the nursery products, uh, you were asking people if they had any of these products or if they had any children, you get a quick no, that's the end of the call, you hang up. But most of the cost was, was born in just getting to that point. Well, you could then be asking about other products that they might have or use. And if the answer is then yes, then you could go into those modules and ask about the other products that you might be interested in for other reasons. So, so it does kind of combine efforts on these to make them, at least on a per product uh, basis, a little more affordable. Um, and so it's one of those things we identify as a gap in our knowledge. When you talk about risk, there's sort of the numerator of the adverse circumstance, but there's also this sort of denominator, which is how often was a product used safely. And that's sort of informative for answering that question as well. So, so NCARE is uh, basically, without even getting product specific at this point, is just a vehicle for getting that kind of information. Thank you. And um, Duane, with regards to um, Item number seven, IOT, the lab out at 5RP. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Sure. I, I think the idea was uh, without spending a lot of money, uh, get some experience with um, uh, expertise from outside the agency through NIST, uh, some, some computer scientists that uh, would focus on looking at what we've um, put out there as a potential risk, which is this hazardization, I think the term we've used, um, get some products, see the potential there of actually exposing these hazards through those products. Uh, and so this project is um, you know, a small uh, investment just to try to kickstart some uh, learning on that with some practical products connected through, uh, through a network to, to get at that. Thank you. Um, pr uh, item number four, saferproducts.gov modernization. We had a hearing on um, the modernization of it and what uh, the users of it and the constituents were interested in, um, in seeing us do, uh, which was an extremely, I thought, informative hearing that we had. I'd like to talk about that a little bit because that is a priority for many, and for us it's a, a good source of data. And so can we, can you, one of you expand uh, on that a little bit in, in what, how we would approach this modernization of safer products. I'm gonna ask Jim if he would mind uh, coming okay. up on this one. Thank you. Um, yes, so um, there has been work that's been uh, ongoing, uh, I'd say probably over the la course of the last year, uh, including the uh, feedback that came from the uh, that came from the uh, the hearing, and also um, a request for information, um, asking for input and uh, advice on modernization and making improvements for saferproducts.gov. Um, we received uh, a number of, of uh, suggestions and things to, uh, that would make that platform uh, more useful. Um, chief among those are making it a more mobile-friendly interface, so it functions currently on a mobile device, but making that more modern. Um, and also looking at ways to streamline the uh, way the data is entered and see, see if there are ways to make that easier. 
Uh, my understanding is that much of the data that is collected through that is required, and so there may be uh, some constraints to quite how far we can do with that. Um, there have also been some other uh, requests that we're considering, including things like um, making, uh, making the data and visualizations of the data more, more available on the site. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Edler. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, it isn't just that NHTSA has one product category. It's there, there are thousands of pieces that go into um, manufacture of a car, but it, uh, in terms of broad uh, product categories, I think that if you look at the medical devices uh, that FDA regulates, they've just got thousands of products that uh, are under their jurisdiction, which is why I'm just curious why, and when you say we're unique, I, I still have trouble uh, figuring that out. You, you needn't respond to that. But one of the concerns that I am uh, entertaining is that, and, and, and let me talk specifically about about retail reporting, because that seems to be the source right now of big data that we're confronting, is that I don't want CPSC to suddenly assume responsibilities that the manufacturers and retailers have. Uh, they've got obligations when they discover products that have defects that could present a substantial product hazard to notify us. And right now, I still feel that we're getting data dumps from uh, big, big institutions like Walmart and Amazon that should be doing their own data analysis uh, to red flag uh, products of concern. And I would hate to see us then take that responsibility onto ourselves. Has, has anybody thought that through and is there a, a good response to, to that? I, I think um, even if we set aside the retailer reporting piece, and we, we currently pay contractors to code all of our incident reports coming in. So there is an efficiency, even without taking on new data, if we were able to use some of these tools to use the machine to do the coding by paying people that to do the coding. That makes sense. Uh, so, I, so set aside that policy question, I think there's value in trying to get to that answer. And if there's a policy direction to bring that in, we've got tool sets to, to manage. And well, do I do see the policy question is, is a big question. One of the other concerns I have is that uh, looking for anomalies, looking for subtle changes in the market, looking for things before they've become evident. The question is, what do we do with that when we get it? It seems to me one of the big problems we have at this agency is we have no problem identifying products that are injuring people. We have problems addressing them. For example, e-scooters I see as a serious issue, and I'm not clear we're on top of that. Uh, I was not happy with the response we had with hoverboards. Uh, so. Part of it is, yes, let's find the anomaly, let's find the subtle hazard, but then the question arises about what we do with that. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about things like chemical hazards. Is there anything in this uh, proposal that would address chronic hazards associated with toxic chemicals? I would say that's probably not its central strength. Um, so I, I don't want to rule out that there's some benefit we could we could derive in that domain, but I would say centrally uh, it, it's difficult when uh, so often they're not talking about the single incident so much as perhaps just the presence of a of, of material that they're concerned about. Uh, one of the other questions uh, that was raised is the whole issue of import surveillance, which is I think a huge issue. Uh, in particular, the issues arising from e-commerce, but I noticed e-commerce was listed as 13th in priority. I would have thought that e-commerce would have been fully integrated into this proposal, and so can you explain the disconnect between uh, the concerns there? Um, I, I think with regards to number uh, 13 on the list, uh, right, part of the, um, part of the uh, ranking on that had to do with there's a dependency on the work that's ongoing right now and that's not complete um, but there's a window of opportunity to get the ideas and projects forward so I, I think that was part of uh, part of the thought and thinking on that however switching to uh, media project two I think the idea there of linking uh, our dynamic case management system with the harmonized tariff code is trying to see if we can tie in De well, I'm using the term defect kind of items for inspection by just staying in the regulated product. So I think that's a way to try to get into that universe. 
to try to see if there's a way to connect the data and make those uh, assessments at import? Well, I think that's the proper way to approach it, but ultimately if we're not do dealing with the defects in imports, to me that means that we've got the serious uh, gap. Um, and I did want to go back to the end cares because uh, picking up on a point that the chairman was making, we've got 15,000 product categories. Uh, I assume we're not going to be doing exposure studies of the 15,000 uh, product categories. Uh, so uh, I'm curious how we would decide which products we're going to look for exposure data. But it still strikes me, and I will admit I am a skeptic about this, that what we need to be doing is assessing what's hurting people and not necessarily what the exposure is. Uh, the it's, exposure is interesting information. It's nice to know. I don't see that it's essential to know when it comes to doing either recalls or safety standards. Um, and so I'm just curious, uh, this is almost a million dollars of expenditures. Uh, can you give me a more concrete uh, idea of how this is going to help us do our job? Yeah, I, I think this is often where I, I get into a, a place where I want to cite specific products, but then it seems like I'm, I'm stepping into policy areas. So I, I'm trying not to do that. But for example, if we were concerned about the uptake of the inter uh, Internet of Things and how many people actually have these things and how many are using them, you know, didn't know when I bought my oven that it actually was enabled for this stuff, but it is. I'm not using it that way. Could I be? I don't know. I, things, things of that nature that we think would be usefully informative to understand the risks that are out there, and especially if, if it's your task to decide what's an unreasonable risk, then you might want to consider how often things, uh, you know, don't end up in, in an adverse outcome as much as you're considering how often that they do. But again, that's, that's certainly your judgment to make. Yeah, and again, for me, the starting point is what's hurting or what's killing people, and then we can look at exposure, but the, in picking up on a point that uh, Commissioner Biacco made, I don't think we need to let the perfect defeat the good here. I think we generally have an idea about what the exposure is, even if we don't know precisely. We can go to the industry, we can find out what industry sales are, and we can get a, a general sense. I, I, this is providing to me a greater level of specificity than, I, than I'm... I'm not certain uh, we would have. And I wanted to just ask about this modest 75,000 expenditure on IoT. And um, maybe just because it's in the news, but it's been in the news constantly about how the Russians and the Chinese are hacking every system that exists. Uh, and I, maybe we're just too small not to have been hacked in a more fundamental fashion. But without detailing the specific security steps we're taking, if we're going to do this project, have we set up proper security to do this, to understand uh, uh, issues relating to IoT? Yeah, I, I think the plan would be there would be an isolated network not attached to any of our working networks to, to, uh, to do that kind of testing that would uh, provide those security. I, I don't mean to jump around, but on item seven, the business process review for IT modernization of the integrated field system, can somebody give me an example or two of the topics that would be addressed? Is this going to be placement of field staff, training of field staff, computer so uh, support, organization of field staff? Can you give me a better idea of what's involved here? But this, it's uh, your six. Oh, I beg six. your pardon. It's yeah. item seven on my list of questions. <laughs> item, uh, yeah, item six uh, is really related to... Uh, modernizing and, and providing a case management system for the regulated uh, area and within compliance. And this process review, before we went out and built a new system based on our process that we've been using, was to make sure and do a review to say, is there a better way to do this? Have we, you know, do we ask for 10 samples because that's what we've always done? Is there a better way to process that? And then that feeds into the requirements uh, piece for the development of the system. So it's part of let's make sure our processes are good before we get to the business requirements for uh, system development. Uh, one last question at this point. Um, I'm looking at Project 10, Child Strength Measurement. Uh, we went out to 5RP and we talked to staff and we were asking, would additional resources move the tip over project uh, more quickly? And I think we were told uh, that uh, throwing additional dollars wouldn't necessarily help. So these are obviously 
incremental dollars above and beyond what we're, we need for doing the tip over standard, is that correct? Well, I think this one's specific on the child strength, so it's, it's broader than uh, than just the tip over piece. It can be used in other activities. Um, but is this something that would be necessary for the tip over project? In other words, I don't want to leave it contingent if this would be essential to the fundamental work on the I'm told no. Okay. Not necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, if we can look at the chart with the 13 projects and if we do the math, where is the sort of above the line, below the line, where we have a reasonable certainty of funding versus uncertainty? Is it between six and seven? Based on the estimate that's in the memo, that's about right. And so, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Borlase, you might have to jump up here since Mr. Ray just bolted. Because <laughs> um, he knew what was coming. So I'll wait till you get to the table. So Dr. Borlase, if we don't fund, accepting what Mr. Hoffman just said, that the likely versus unlikely line is six up, likely to get funded, seven down, unlikely, recognizing Mr. Hoffman, there are all those caveats of that go into all of this contract work and that what we end up approving might not be the list of likely and unlikely. I get all that. But what we know today, uh, Dr. Borlase, if we don't fund, for instance, the smoke alarm project number eight, what's the safety cost to not funding that? Um, for, for number eight, there's no uh, impact on what we're already planning and doing. So, uh, for example, the commission has previously funded the smoke and CO alarm survey that is, undergo that is underway right now. This the completion of that is not dependent on this money. This is actually funding follow-on work after the uh, survey is completed. So the impact of not funding it now is we could reevaluate it as part of the 20 operating plan, um, whether it could be funded then, but it will not impact the current ongoing CO and smoke alarm survey. Got it. Okay, how about number nine? What's the safety impact of not funding the gas appliance CO sensor work that's proposed? Um, again, it doesn't impact any of the current commission direction in the 19 op plan. For example, this is not uh, impacting the ANPR that the commission's directed to be brought up. This would uh, impact uh, the follow-on work in terms of um, when we would do it again, it would be something we would evaluate as part of the 20 operating plan if, if it's not in the 19 mid-year. And I noticed in the description for this project that it was deemed that this was necessary to answer questions that were raised in the voluntary standard on this issue on furnaces in terms of the durability of these sensors that are being used in Europe and Japan. Is that something, assuming the commission approves an ANPR on this and we want to move forward on the rulemaking, is that work, though, that we will have to address at some point to do a mandatory standard? Well, certainly in addressing the effectiveness of the current voluntary mm -hmm. standard for, uh, for if we were proposing a rule, yes. Okay. And on the trial, the next one, the child strength measurement, uh, Commissioner Adler was asking about this. I can envision, of course, this being involved in um, PPA, PPPA packaging and child resistance work and other things. What's the direct safety cost of not funding that project? Um, this is actually just trying to uh, supplement funding that the Commission's already provided. So really what we're just trying to do is expand uh, the number of questions we can ask or, you know, the number of uh, different data measurements we can get from the children as they're being tested, which is already funded separately. So the impact is we would just have a slightly, res slightly less rich data set at the end of the testing if this was not funded. Mm -hmm. And how about on the ATV 111, what's the safety cost of not doing that? Uh, this is uh, the last piece of that multi-year um, data. The um, direct safety would just be really understanding for what's out there, for example, designs that are um, coming from Australia, et cetera, what is the impact? But there are a number of uh, other technical reports that have already been funded that will already be be published. So this uh, just doesn't complete the effort that we've invested the time and the money on. And it would uh, limit in some way the amount of technical information we then bring to the voluntary standards organizations. This whole ATV effort has been focused on putting together all this technical information to go back and work with the voluntary standards organizations. It would just uh, provide 
uh, kind of a less fulsome picture than we planned in going back to them. And unlike maybe the child strength measurement, but maybe like the smoke alarm one or even the gas appliance, do you envision coming back and looking for 2020 funds potentially to do the ATV work if it's not funded now? That's something we would then evaluate as part of the, the mix with everything else. Um, you know, that's part of the mid-year process is if it's uh, not funded in the mm -hmm. uh, you know EXHR funding at our plan time, we've got that list of projects that then we come back and look for at mid-year. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's been helpful, uh, Mr. Ray. You benefited from Dr. Borles jumping in in your absence. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, the there are three. It sounds like there are three IT-related projects in this. There's the IFS modernization. There's the e-commerce work, and there's obviously what you've described as mid-year one and two. I understand that as you're presenting it for maybe for all three of them that we're not really committing if we fund these or are we committing to some of them but not all of them if we fund these projects i'm trying to understand what our commitment level is and then to the extent that there is a commitment level what are we looking at in rough dollar terms that will immediately be walled off in the staff's proposed 2020 op plan because we've taken this step today like that is now off limits going forward I like the way you phrase that question. I think that provides clarity. So first, let me tackle the results, and then I'll tackle the fencing question. So let's just go through them. Uh, so product project one, uh, the commitment there is to have a plan and an implementation plan that we can then get back together and evaluate, whether it's in a forum like this or through the executive director, um, and then ultimately probably the operating plan. Um, with respect to project number six, um, one of the things that's been discussed is, hey, we, it's great that we want to go for a new enterprise data approach, but we have existing systems that are becoming antiquated. So I, I see the IFS as a separate item. I would note that this is a, uh, this is not, point has not been made. The IFS business process review was a commission directed assignment in the operating plan. And as a result of the shutdown, we do not have the man hours to complete the project. So this is simply the complete work that has already been directed to do some process mapping and see what a uh, modernized IFS might look like. So that's all we're committing to is essentially a pre-requirements. Uh, and then res with respect to e-commerce concept of operations, there's an IT component to this. I, I see this as a more programmatic um, proposal. I, I don't want to misstate it. It's in Dwayne's area. But I, I would say that I wouldn't characterize that one as, a, as an IT. With respect to fencing um, for 2020 operating plan, in the timeline slide that I proposed, uh, number 13, I think I... Uh, I think I made this, I tried to make this clear that there wouldn't be money necessarily fenced in the 2020 operating plan. I think we would be coming back to you in May of 2020 as part of the mid-year process for uh, additional work. You'd m be much more likely to see a startup request in the next OMB budget this September. So none of the, if I'm hearing right, none of these projects would fence any 2020 money in the staff proposal? At this time, there's no recommendation to do that. The 2020 has already been formulated. We're going to put a 2020 operating plan before you. I, I don't want to prejudice the recommendations of the executive director, but I also don't want to put the cart before the horse. This is a concept. Get your reaction to it. Put the plan together. And then I think my advice as a CFO would be to follow the budget process at that point. Sure. And that's very helpful. I appreciate that response. Uh, and then Dr. Borlase, in the remaining time, back to you for a little bit. There's no... Um, there were no adjustments proposed in the mid-year, and obviously a mid-year is a half-year adjustment to our operating plan. It doesn't stand alone. This is, in essence, an amendment, a proposed amendment to the Commission's operating plan, but there's no proposed amendment to any of our mandatory standards tables work or our voluntary standards table work. Does that Should we read into that that staff anticipates hitting every objective that is in the operating plan for both the mandatory standards and the Voluntary standards? I think it's fair to say that we're executing the commission direction that's in the operating plan. And um, certainly for EXHR, if there's anything as the year's gone up on, you know, furlough time, et cetera, lost, we're working through the executive director's office to make sure you all are apprised of any changes that are going to happen from what the commission direction was in the operating plan to what we're able to execute. 
And, and I, I guess I'll ask the flip. Is there anything that staff knows now at this juncture is it's highly unlikely that that target will get met that's currently in an operating plan for uh, either the mandatory standards or the really the mandatory standards because voluntary standards, there's no target, it's just a dot. Well, we've had the previous discussions about the crib mattresses, the supplemental crib mattresses, NPR working, like I said, through the process, executive director, and then also in our briefings to each of the individual offices. That one specifically talking about the challenges we're having in meeting the commission direction in 19 on that one. But it's still, you're not proposing any changes at this juncture to the mandatory standards table? We did not propose any, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bioko. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry if I jump around here. Um, okay, I, I got to ask you this because I'm a little confused. Maybe it was my notes, and I know you're very precise. So when I add all this up, so we have in the summary, there's four, four point nine million to spend. Projects add up to five point something. That's a hundred thousand bucks difference, right? In '75, we have a project here that. Um, for IOT, which I think is important. And then when we spoke around the budget time, I was under the impression that there was five million available that we would be anticipating in mid-year. Now I'm hearing 3.5. Can you just help me put all those numbers together? Sure. Um, first off, uh, I've been caught. <laughs> we, the, uh, let's see, which one was it? Uh, project number four, saferproducts.gov. That project had a last minute change in the estimate and we updated the table and didn't catch the uh, the math in that's the okay i mean I, so I, this is not a challenge please no, no, don't take it that way not at all. i'm just trying to see where i can get the most money at the yeah. most use yep and then with respect to um our conversations and uh, commissioner k with his experience was kind of alluding to this so the current unexecuted balance if the year were to end today that's the number that i've given you that's my best okay. guess and and what we talked about is sort of what happens between now and the end of the year. And what I, the reason I think that number could grow, in fairness, is I don't know what ultimately won't get executed in the procurement process. Every year there are things that are in the operating plan that the commission has directed us to do that for one reason or another, either a contractor doesn't bid or the bid proposal that we received is just so wildly different than what it is we wanted. We make the tough decision mm -hmm. to just say, we're gonna we're just gonna cut this, and that results in additional funds in the okay. mid-year process. So that's why there's some fle fungibility in that okay. number. Okay, that that helps. And so the the line that we were talking about between six and seven could definitely move, and and it would move depending upon the reorder if we decide as a commission to reorder them. Right. Yes. Of okay. Course. So let, let's talk about this uh, saferproducts.gov because you mentioned that. We have 590,000 noted on this. Do we really need 590? Uh, not 500. Right, five hundred ninety thousand. Do we really need that much to do what what Mr. Rolfus was talking about? I mean, what does that? cost? a lot of money. Well, I'll let Jim respond to this specifically if he would like to come to the table. I would just note that this estimate did go through the investment review board process. Oh no, I try. I, you know, so, I'm just trying so, to figure out sure. what what costs so much. This is my ignorance. I apologize. But. So, so it is an estimate, and we won't actually know what the what the actual cost. Of the uh, of the project itself will will be until we actually get the bids from from the contractors. Uh, this is based on um, estimates from my team, based on similar work, um, looking at the extent of changes that uh, need to be made to the site, and uh, looking and calculating that against um, uh, labor hour costs. And okay. so that's how that's how we generate that estimate. The estimate could end up going higher or lower um, and you know, there's also the possibility of making some adjustments in terms of which requirements actually go into the formal contract or not but right now okay. uh, this is this is the best estimate that we that okay. we have and it, it is somewhat of, a, of an evolving process okay so so my questions here are really designed so I can make a decision as to if I have this pot of money and this pot of money where do we get the the, the most return for for that expenditure and so when I look at you know, 590,000 on saferproducts.gov, which we all agree needs to be updated, um, and compare that against, right now we have 7.4, or 1.45 million on the, the mid-year one and mid-year two, which I think everybody agrees needs to be done. Um, and, and we're investing in that. So comparing those two, 
Um, I'm just trying to get a, a better feel. And then let me take that a step further. So I heard about two projects. One was the smoke alarm survey, which we have 150,000 attributed to. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have NCARE, which is also a survey that we have almost a million dollars attributed to. And projects one or mid-year one and two, we need to do to analyze that data. I mean, getting more data does us nothing if we can't analyze that. Would you agree? I would say the analytical challenges that we, we've talked about with our incident data are sort of independent in the state that we expect to get from the survey. Uh, analytically, it doesn't present to us the same challenges. Why not? Uh, because it would be more structured and more, or more confined in terms of what we're looking for. We would have a set of questions that we were asking people and having them answer it. And so just the, um, the scope of the analytic task doesn't compare to finding anything potentially dangerous in the incident data. So, oh, I see. Okay, so we're not going to really find out anything, for example, when NCARES about whether something's dangerous or could cause harm. We're, we're getting ex what people are using, right? Mm -hmm. So, to be fair, I mean, analysts do this stuff all the time. I mean, can't we reach out and there's other forms other than spending a million dollars, which is a significant amount for this agency to find out what products people are using. It's a gap in our knowledge, but it's not as big of a gap as it is in our system. we got big gaps in our system. Yeah, I, I think it's, it, I felt that my responsibility to bring this to you is something to consider, but it's certainly up to you to decide how to move forward. Okay, I, I just yeah. want to make sure that I'm not making assumptions, that's all. Um, which one of the projects, or which project or projects on the list of 13 best complement mid-years one and two? Well, I, I would say the one that, I wouldn't say, I don't know if compliments, I would say the one that to me is related would probably be mid-year 13 um, because I, I do think that that e-commerce programmatic strategy would inform the system piece. I don't know that it's as urgent. Okay. And how about number six? Because I think um, when, when Elliot was asking these questions, I wrote down, well, why isn't this part of mid-years one and two? I mean, shouldn't this already be funded, this identification or modernization of our integ integrated field system, or do I just not understand? I, I think we just viewed that as um, a different need. So this is, we got it. We, we don't have one in our regulated uh, product area. We need one. We've got it. We put that in the mid-year, or it was in the operating plan, as Jay pointed out. And we need we don't have people to throw at it, but we need to we need to make that move ahead. Uh, so I think that was why it was broken out as a separate process. Okay, on the ATV stability and rollover, we have uh, six hundred ninety-five thousand on here. Is there any suggestion that the voluntary standards are not moving on a positive basis forward? This uh, this specific project was uh, part of a multi-year ATV plan that uh, that the XHR staff developed uh, several years ago, uh, and so this was bringing that last project to, to bear. It wasn't necessarily tied to um, voluntary standard activities okay. or any of the work. See, I thought I understood um, George say that it would give us more data to go into the voluntary standard process and be, you know, have more information. That's what confused sure, me. Sure, yeah. It, it, it gets the proof of concept on these um, um, occupant protection devices, and that may drive some recommendations in, in that area. I, I wouldn't want to say there there's nothing that we see. But what I was trying to get at is I don't think the voluntary standards were driving the activity. It was... No, no, I know that. I mean, okay. I'm just trying to see if, if you, know, you just said we might give us some information that may help us for 700000 Sure. And I wanted to know, is there any reason to believe that we really need this, that there's some reason that the volu voluntary standards uh, that are the process isn't going to adequately address the, the issue? Uh, I don't know that I got a good answer okay. to that right That's now. Okay. I'm happy to get back to you on that. All right, that's fine. Okay. Um, I write my stuff down as we're talking, and then I can't go back. I wanted to go back to something that, that Bob said. Oh, IoT. So IoT, 75,000, I think, is, is a small number. And I think, I, I, I don't think we're really developing a, pro a project to see if we're being hacked. Rather, it's to look at projects that can be hacked and to see if there's a safety component to it. Is that correct? Yes. 
Okay. I heard on the radio just today, which I had never thought of up until today, made me a little nuts, um, that there's a concern that your camera on your PC that everybody has can easily be hacked. Imagine the safety um, risks and harms that can result from something like that. So uh, I, I point that out because I think this is a very important project, and I just wanted to make sure that we're, we're going to use that money if we vote on that to actually look at, at the safety components of the product, not necessarily the CPSC being hacked. It, it is focused purely on the safety of the uh, product and whether the product by some external uh, action could become dangerous. Okay. Through, through and, and I just read this week a 2017 um, report from the staff that talked about some of the hazards that they've identified a few years ago. I think Elliot instructed the staff to have it done. And, and there was a lot of IoT stuff in there. So um, I, I think this is important. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Feldman. Thanks. Um, and following on the discussion of the IoT lab, I understood, and I don't want to speak for any of my colleagues, but I, I understood Commissioner Adler's uh, concerns about security as sort of uh, coming from a, a place of operational security. You're absolutely correct. It wasn't okay. that we're trying to develop something to prevent ourselves from being hacked. Right. That, that, that it, it, it makes sense. You know, obviously, CPSC is a safety regulator. We are not a privacy or security regulator, but there's a nexus between all of those things and safety, potentially, uh, that if we're putting together a lab to take a look at uh, a, a connectivity, that it be air-gapped or that there be some sort of security measures put in place to make sure that we're not inadvertently uh, opening up a, a potential attack vector against the agency that would create security or, or privacy concerns with respect to our broader systems. Okay. Right? I, I, the light bulb just went off, so I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Bob. Um, I, listening to the questions that were asked, I, I think I've had a, a lot of what I wanted to push on addressed. Um, I, I still, you know, when my eye runs down the, uh, the, the right-hand column here, uh, the number that jump, jumps out is this uh, nearly million dollars for NCARES. Um, this is the largest ticket item on, on the, the table here. It is, uh, you know, almost 30% of the total projected unobligated funds, the 3.5 million that exists right now. Um, I don't fully understand what it is, what the survey is looking to accomplish, how this fits into our broader mission. So if you could take some time and just unpack that a little bit, that would be helpful. Yeah, and, and just to give you some history on this, so for example, I think it was 2001, the last time we did an ATV exposure study, and so that, that cost about a million dollars at that time to reach out nationally, hear from everyone about what they had, what they used, and I think it's because it, there are times where, where we find ourselves in, in trying to understand an issue uh, that where, where the elusive piece is the use. So for example, we, we had something come up, I, I think, in the past year where we weren't sure uh, if, you know, there was an outcome that, that might have been driven by, say, a product life assumption. And this is a, an op opportunity to sort of observe that directly and say, okay, are people really keeping these products as long? And are they actually using them? Many of us may have a bicycle in our garage that, yes, we bought it, yes, we still have it, but we haven't touched it in three years and it's got a quarter inch of dust. So um, it, it's addressing that sort of gap that exists between simply talking about sales and product life and getting into actual use. And then also it can get you to, towards some of these other frontiers, whether it's thinking about chemical exposure or it's thinking about um, some, of the, uh, some of these newer products where maybe a lot of the, uh, the adverse outcomes haven't manifested themselves yet, and yet we are concerned about that, so we may want to sort of understand how people haven't used some of these newer things that, it, that have just come out. Okay, so it, it would be a survey that would increase our insight and expertise into product life cycles and sort of overall exposure based on sort of how products are distributed in the marketplace and what the sort of exposure ratio would be? Or simply, we would just say, what products do people have and use? And so if, if we've got some that are on our radar and we're, we're, we're questioning what that universe looks like, for example, within our ATV report, we pulled out certain tables because we felt like we no longer could use data that was that old to talk about um, y you know, what people might have uh, in terms of their exposure. And so it's... It's just bringing to our understanding of any particular product 
that element of not just what's gone wrong, but what what people have and how often things haven't gone wrong. And, and again, I think that's for all of you to judge whether that's valuable to you in, in making your insights or whether you feel like the other sources are useful. Okay. That's good background information. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask about uh, item number 13, the, the e-commerce con ops. Um, can you unpack a little bit who would be involved in putting together this concept of operations? Um, I, I see that this is an exit program within within the agency, so it, I would imagine Mr. Jaholski would be intimately involved with this. But is this a, a in, in developing this concept? Does this contemplate um, coordinating with other entities in the federal government outside of CPSC? Are there uh, industry stakeholders that are sort of integral to how e-commerce flows in the United States that that would necessarily have to be a part of this? And are there um, some force multiplier or cost savings associated with uh, reaching out to a broader and more diverse group of stakeholders to help actually draft this concept? A lot to answer. I'll try to get them all. But uh, I've got four minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, I got it. Um, <laughs> first of all, yes, uh, Jim's team is definitely uh, would be uh, the lead on this project. Uh, this anticipates contracting that workout, so getting uh, put uh, issuing a contract, um, and likely use one that we already have in place, uh, and and that would uh, would feed that. Uh, as far as other agencies, uh, obviously we're going to be engaged with CBP in that. Um, any other entities that you know, I think part of this hedging is uh, the current work that we're doing is identifying. Uh, stakeholders that would be relevant in this space to uh, to to talk to and get their perspective, and I think that's going to influence how this plan and this concept of operations would be developed. Okay, I think it would make sense to loop in a broader set of stakeholders at the earliest possible opportunity when you're developing the concept to make sure that whatever is ultimately developed um, makes sense in the real world, is implementable, and is something that we then don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, in, in terms of deployment when we get to that stage. It's not a if, it's, it's a when. This is something that's going to be on the agency's table for the foreseeable future. I, I just I, I want to go about this in the most efficient way possible. Sure, I, we, we agree with that. Um, lastly, I, I wanted to ask about item number 10, the child strength measurement. Um, uh, this is $100,000 for a quantitative analysis of postural data. Um, Dr. Borlase, where are we deficient in our understanding uh, of child strength measurement? What is this expenditure going to ultimately tell us that we don't know currently? So we already have a sorry, we already have a funded uh, effort underway on uh, doing child strength uh, measurement and. Uh, as part of the research in it, they are measuring the forces associated to children opening things, gripping things, et cetera. The idea here is not just gathering some of that force data, but then getting additional postural data of how children are standing, how they are orienting their bodies when they do these forces. So uh, in terms of the deficiency, like I said, it's uh, really a supplement to an already funded effort to try and gather some of this additional information on how children stand, position their body when they're doing these forces. Okay. And what would that tell us that we don't already know? Um, they, sorry, they originally... Maybe more was, to the point, how is that useful? Um, it's, it's useful, uh, especially for the anthropometric data, as we're looking um, at updating some of this older information on children's strength uh, for CPSC's purposes, looking at you know, for different ages when they're interacting with products, what do we expect the uh, greatest, you know, uh, pull force on a string would be if it's, um, you know, gripping a doorknob, you know, or to the point on packaging, you know, how do they actually grab things and twist them? Some of it is how are they positioning themselves when they do it also. Okay. When we look at the child strength and human factors data going back, I mean, I imagine some of this is fairly dated. Um, when we look at the data sets that's, that's currently informing our, our human factors analysis at the agency, um, 
how much does this data change over time? I know that when you look at height and weight data, there's all kinds of nutritional factors that, that go that you see sort of wider swings and fluctuation. But when you're actually looking at child hand strength, for, for instance, is that something that you would expect to see a, a large amount of fluctuation over time, or is that relatively constant? Um, like for that specific example, I, we'd have to get back to you. Uh, part of the original like funding and the and the push was to get this updated because it it was older, and um, is data that is used beyond CPSC. You know, so CPSC. Uh, whether it's using height weight data that's published by CDC, uh, updated regularly, or just trying to use the best available data. This was an effort of CPSC working with, uh, in this case, University of Michigan, to develop the best available data. But I can get back to you on specifics of, for the different sources, what they are, because it does vary depending on what we need. Okay. I see I'm almost out of time, but uh, this has been a good discussion. I appreciate you all being here. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are going to go one more round of questions. I think there's just a couple of cleanup questions from everyone. I have one, and then we'll continue on uh, down the dais. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the IoT and the funding. Um, as it's as as a parent, um, everyone at the dais is interested in IoT. Something that, um, with Patty Adair's work, uh, being spearheading the IoT work, the intergovernmental agency work. Is the 75,000 sufficient number to get the lab to the point that it needs to be at to be able to accomplish its mission? And is the three-month period to contract with the NIST uh, folks, is that sufficient amount of time to inform us as well? I, I think um, where we're at at this point and when we were looking at uh, what's a ripe project for mid-year, I think we, we made that assessment that this this would be good. It would help us advance our knowledge of that. Um, I think as our team is always capable of coming up with lots of new ideas and, and broader projects, but I think this is ripe for, uh, for where we're at it in the process. Thank you. And one last question, because there has been quite a bit of discussion about NCARES, and it is expensive. Um, so in addition to what you've talked about, and I notice here in the description of the project, um, it does refer to, to the approval that we have to obtain to do these is, is onerous, and I understand that. Um, but it does refer to pilot survey, pilot analysis, and then full-scale implementation. Is there a way to begin this work or to do it without the entire allocation of the 950000 I, I think there would be. Uh, so, yeah, what we've described would actually get us all the way to collecting some pilot data, pilot data, so that's what that estimate included. If we were to stop short of that and simply have them provide to us a design costing and, and a, a paperwork uh, a PRA package to send to OMB, I think it would come in some, something less than that and something quite noticeably less. Um, I, I don't have that handy, but I could get that. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. What's a data lake? I've been meaning to ask that, and I forgot. <laughs> if you can tell me in 30 seconds or less, because otherwise uh, maybe a separate conversation. Sure. A uh, simple, simple explanation of a data lake is it's similar to a data warehouse, except the data that is contained in it tends not to be as uh, formally structured as in a data warehouse. And okay. there's some advantages to that. In All that. right. There's some advantages. It's, it's more and fluid and more liquid. In our, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I did want to echo something that Commissioner Biaco said. Uh, this, the, the two big proposals, the data, uh, item one, item two, uh, I still think I would like to have a separate briefing, so I'm just going to ask that as a courtesy, and I would appreciate it if you wouldn't mind doing that. Um, I did also want to address the whole, the issue of ATVs uh, because uh, this is culminating many, many years of work with ATVs, and I'll just say that we've been addressing ATV hazards for 30 years, and they still persist, and we still see far too many horrible injuries, far too many deaths, and far too many children killed on ATVs. Uh, I don't know that I'm prepared simply to say let's let's work with the voluntary standards 
uh, community on this. I still think that we need to have the possibility of doing a mandatory standard. So uh, this to me is probably a bigger project, especially if it's the culmination of work that we need in order to decide whether we move forward, uh, either prodding the voluntary standard sector or moving to a mandatory standard. Um, I did want, that's just a comment. With respect to project number eight, the smoke and CO alarm local codes, is this designed to go and find out not just generally what are people doing, but what are people doing when the local code mandates a smoke alarm and a CO alarm? Yes, it is, um, as you um, you may know, different codes throughout the country I do require know, yes. different pieces, and this is the correlate. Our data that we had with the, where they were and what were the code ap applying to that. And I'm curious about the protocol, and I don't want to get too granular, but this is one where we tell people in advance that we're coming to interview them about whether they have a smoke alarm or a CO alarm. Uh, are we going to say, oh, and by the way, we're checking to see whether you're compliant with the local code? I don't think our intention was to be the com code compliance. No, uh, but is group? it to even alert them? Because to me, this I, I hate to get into anything political, but it's like saying, are you a citizen when we're doing the census survey? You're not likely to get an honest answer if somebody no, I, understands I think, that the code requires them to have a smoke alarm or a CO alarm. I think the idea on this is more to just assimilate all the codes and correlate the data as opposed to the individual person getting the survey. Uh, more, I, more of a back-end piece okay, of it. Okay, well, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to go to the uh, Safe Sleep Initiative. And forgive me, um, it, first, first question is, if we were to abandon uh, inclined sleepers as a project, I'm not suggesting that for a moment, but if we were, is this project still a critical project? Uh, yes, because it, it, it's broader than just that class of products. Uh, it is the sleep environment um, and the warning labels and messaging associated with that. And I just want to share an impression. It's my impression that we have gazillions of studies assessing the impact of warning labels on consumer behavior, consumer purchase. What possible additional information could we get from this, or am I missing something? Obviously, I am missing something, but what is it that I'm missing? I, I don't think you're missing any additional other than the description staff has in there. Um, I think those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kay. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Hoffman, just one more question. We were, in our last round, we were talking about fencing. And I think by that, you were not talking about the offloading of stolen goods. You were talking about <laughs> carving out budgetary funds on a going forward basis. One project I didn't ask about was NCARES and whether if we fund NCARES now, is there fenced money in the 2020 operating plan? Because that does say it's a multi-year effort. I would need to work with Steve and evaluate that if, if, if this item was ultimately improve, approved and funded. But we haven't prejudiced the next operating plan with fenced funds at this time. Okay, so uh, if it sounds like, and I'm not, I don't want you to get ahead of yourself, it sounds like it, that you haven't anticipated that this would be funded and put it in the proposal, at least that you're working with. It, we're, we're still in the early stages of formulating the operating plan, so that's a separate issue at this point. Okay, great, that was it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bayoko. Just a hypothetical. When I add up the things that I would like to see us do, um, and take out some of the things that I'm not a big proponent of. Is there any one of these or um, any particular uh, project on this list that you would like to have more money for if we took some from one thing? Because I, I have to agree with Commissioner Adler that I don't know what else we're going to get from that particular um, initiative. I'm just wondering. I know it's a hypothetical. If you haven't thought about it, you don't have to answer. Just wondering. I, no. I don't think we do. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Uh, turning back to item seven, the IoT lab, um, that $75,000 buys us what? Is this increased staffing and bringing on new FTEs to help service the lab? Is this uh, equipment and um, 
in, in, in device acquisition? Is this sort of rent in physical real estate? I'm, I'm, I'm still a little unclear on what exactly we're purchasing with this 75 grand. Sure. So uh, ultimately, it's a study, uh, but that involves uh, tech, uh, technical advice from NIST and, and that, and also the purchase uh, procurement of products and uh, some limited networking piece to put it all together to to do the study on uh, on the on the products. Okay, I thought this was a little bit more broad based than just a study. Um, uh, but it sounds like it is. It sounds like there's yeah. I mean, the there's, there's actual be, acquisition yeah. to get a lab up and running. We got to buy. We buy, got to buy some products. We got to put them, uh, network them, and then we're going to do a study on the products. But George can. Mr. Add Borley, Dr. Borley, did you want to jump in? Just that uh, the, a lot of the funding we're talking about with NIST is through an interagency agreement. So uh, it's not us hiring an FTE. It's uh, an interagency group with NIST to have uh, some of their expertise come in. Okay. Commissioner Feldman, would you yield for a second if I can follow up on what you're asking? I'd be happy to. So, thank you. Is this scalable, meaning if we move money away from one of these other projects, let's say that $100,000 and it's now one seventy-five, could you do a lot more? And if so, what would that be? Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. I don't know, and I don't know in that when we put it together, um, when we discussed with NIST the idea the scope of what we came up with was the 75K. So, um, you know, in the discussion of what we wanted to do, the answer was 75K. Okay, and, it would be great if there could be follow-up on the scalability, if possible, please. Thank you. Well, I, I think as, as uh, staff proposed it, um, this, this was the right thing to get ourselves into this. I think if we start looking at broader and scaling, we may have issues with uh, the ability to accommodate this, this product talking about physical infrastructure impacts within the laboratory that are that are not anticipated and I don't think we can react to that at this at this point but. Commissioner Bianca did you I, I just I'm, I'm still not clear and I'm glad I'm glad thank you for letting us follow up we're not going to study whether we need an IOT lab we've already made that decision right this is going to be what the next step of that like when, at the end of this seventy-five thousand, can I go out to five RP and see, no matter how small it is, that we're moving forward? Uh, you will see um, these devices in a lab. What devices? Whatever the the IoT connected devices that we procure. I don't, okay, so I don't we are going to look those. at actual yeah. consumer products. Actual consumer okay. products. That makes me feel better. Or, yes, and uh, so I, I think where I'm hedging here is this lab term, and I think it's. Um, you know, you can take a little piece of a part of a building and call it your lab, or you can create a whole lab, and that those are very different cost structures. That's why I'm a little hedging on that. Which is why I'm asking about that's, it, because I can't okay. visualize it either. Okay, thank you. That's thank you, okay. Peter. Uh, reclaiming my time. I, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any additional questions? Okay. Having heard no further questions, I again would like to thank the staff for their time and uh, expertise this morning. Uh, and everyone who had a part, I know that you're the face of, of the mid-year, but there are many people behind the scenes who also contributed to the mid-year plan. And uh, I also want to thank them as well. Um, I also want to thank our secretary, Alberta. Thank you very much for keeping the time. And uh, to Rock, who managed to keep the lights on today in OCM. <laughs> So um, having heard no further questions, this concludes the public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission.